Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Lang Buisson webinar today on managing the money flow in medical tourism. Um, I must say many thanks to our partner on this event, uh, Western Union. Uh, we'll be hearing from Andrew Brown from Western Union later on uh, during the afternoon. Uh, next slide, please, Jane. I've been involved in medical travel for many years, and I'm aware that uh, although attracting international patients is a major challenge, once your hospital or facility has brought those patients into your hospital or clinic, getting paid for the treatment that you've provided can be an even bigger challenge. Indeed, when you're, when you're targeting international patients, one of the key considerations is, will I get paid? how will I get paid? And more importantly, when will I get paid? Some of you may know that in my younger years, I was heavily involved in the international patient market uh, in London's private hospitals. Uh, and we took patients requiring complex treatment, uh, many of them for heart conditions, uh, and they were often funded by overseas governments. I can well remember those moments sitting in the executive director's office um, when we were worried about a patient who'd just got a heart bypass operation. Uh, the patient was in intensive care. Um, the patient's relatives obviously wanted the patient to get well as quickly as possible. But from the point of view of the hospital, we also wanted the patient to get well as soon as possible. But a key uh, factor there was the, the level of cost that that patient was racking up in an intensive care bed um, and how we were going to chase the bill for that payment. Today's panellists will, I hope, help us to solve some of those challenges. So our panel today um, has a real kind of wide perspective on, on this challenge of collecting money from international patients. Um, it's a pan-European, indeed uh, an international panel, and we have the perspective and an intermediary and advisor in terms of Christian here, um, a provider, Anthony, from Barcelona Children's Hospital, and then uh, a payment facilitator and solution provider uh, with Andrew Brown from Western Union. The way we work the panel uh, this afternoon is each of our panellists is going to give a short presentation to provide some background to what they do, uh, their business, uh, and the issue around international patient payments. Um, and they will then join a panel discussion on, on the topic. During their individual presentations and during the panel discussion, I encourage you to ask some questions of them. Um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom. Please feel free at any stage to put a, a question into that uh, facility. Um, and you can also vote up uh, questions that you see that other people have posed that you would like to be asked. Uh, and I'll fire some of those at the panel and the session towards the end. We'll also be conducting a couple of polls to gather your input during today's webinar. So keep an eye on out, out for that. Uh, and, and let's get some of your views. So let's go to our first contributor, Christian Fadi El Khoury, he's Head of Consulting at MESC International Patient Services. Welcome, Christian. Uh, you are joining us from where? Hi, Keith. Uh, thank you. I'm joining you from Germany. Excellent. And you're not locked down yet? We are not locked down yet. If we follow our Austrian neighbours, this might be <laughs> not too long before could, we find ourselves it, in the same situation again. It could be on the way. So over to you, Christian. Thank you very much. So welcome everybody. Thank you to, to Keith Pollard, uh, Lang Brisson and Western Union for honing, uh, hosting this uh, event. Uh, I will speak on the topic of medical tourism in 2021 and about some of the opaque business practices focusing on pain points and payment. I will not be the one providing the solutions today. I will just speak about the issues from our perspective as a consultant. Um, I will start off with a short introduction. Thank you, Jade. So our company has been in the industry for over 40 years. We are the first medical tourism facilitator in Germany. We have treated as a facilitator. We had the privilege to, to uh, treat 52,000 patients from all over the globe, but with a 
major focus on the GCC and CIS. Uh, we have always prided ourselves on, on this being actually a family business and I'm carrying this company now the second generation. So for us, transparency and trust, integrity is the most important part. It's easily said, of course, I can understand this, but we have quite the reputation in the Middle East and we are related to this company in a way that we really focus on putting the patient first, even as a consultant, where on any project we, we work on, we try to emphasize patient experience. We can go to the next slide. I will try to keep this uh, introduction as short as possible. Um, so we do still operate as a medical tourism facilitator, mostly for patients who have been with us in the third generation now, and they are uh, reliant on the service. So we continue to provide it for them. And this will go on uh, until uh, the next generation takes over at some point. We are a project advisor, advisor and joint venture project. So we try to stay in this lane of medical tourism and helping international companies who try to enter. Next slide, please. So the consulting services we do provide, actually they go into strategy and operations, entire outlook of the company, how to start it, uh, marketing and press, as well as legal and ethical issues. In Germany, legal issues around medical tourism are quite uh, important and they come in into the payment process and also ethical pro uh, issues, which I will slightly touch on later, are basically my focus points within consultancy. Um, since medical tourism is a growing and developing industry, but it also means that sometimes ethical standards, they lack a bit behind. And so we try to put them on the forefront. Next slide, please. And then project development, the entire standard, basically procedure of uh, market analysis, feasibility studies, and then also negotiating deals and auditing uh, implementation at later stages to make sure everything goes fine. I think this was the, <laughs> the end and we can go to the next one and we dive into the topic. So we are going to speak about opaque business practices and medical tourism. I kept it very basic. I will try to focus on these pain points that we see that happen in practice. We can go to the next one. So just have a general outlook. And so everybody uh, is in the right mindset for this. If we look at the participant of medical tourism, uh, main participants, of course, is the patient, number one, who often operates through a facilitator, an intermediary uh, or a third party administrator, whatever it might be trying to or helping him to find a hospital that is suitable to treat his illness in a different country. Um, there will be often his connection to the medical service provider, to the, ho the hospital, but in many cases, patients find their ways into uh, hospitals themselves. So intermediaries are not always uh, necessary for the process. And there's often a fourth party involved sponsors, or we call them the cost bearer, those who are financing this medical treatment. Keith has touched on it. It's often foreign governments, it can be insurance companies, it can be even private companies that are paying for medical procedures of their uh, employees. There's often many more uh, participants involved, but again, I try to keep it as simple as possible. We can jump into the next one. So if we have these uh, multiple, multiple participants, and here I added actually a second facilitator, a second intermediary, sometimes there's an in-country agent who helps the, uh, the um, domestic uh, agent on the side of the patient. You have this process of the patient communicating to a sponsor, clearing everything about payment. He's then communicating to the facilitator. It will go down the change until it reaches the medical service provider. Um, and at that stage, we have a couple of issues which are uh, loss in transmission. So something you communicated at the start of the process, it might not really end up in the end. Uh, you have lack of transparency. The patient can often not control what is communicated uh, since he has no direct contact to the hospital. And you have planning errors that occur at this stage because so many things might get mixed up. Next slide, please. And if you look at this process now, we really try to focus on the payment in medical tourism. And this is the process, I, uh, process I've uh, spoken about. You have the initial inquiry by the patient. You have the opening of the case file within the hospital where they collect the data, they assess it, and they do the calculation of how much it might approximately cost. They do the follow-up with the patient, they inform them about it. And then at some point, the patient will decide to travel. And then treatment takes place. And uh, I've learned out here the multiple points where payment might come in where payment might be requested by the hospital this isn't the same for every hospital we are working with many hospitals all over the globe and they are choosing different parts now it happens that you have indeed the payment request after the initial assessment so it's 
not even an actual cost estimation has taken place, but the hospital knows, well, this is the average for this kind of treatment under these circumstances. And we want to actually request payment before we continue the, pro the process. Since they get many requests, they try to filter it a bit and um, they want the patient to commit by paying in advance, uh, which often is the case, but in, at in such early stage, it might actually happen. And now I'm not judging these payment requests. I'm just telling you how it is often. Um, then you have it, of course, after the cost calculation, the hospital knows a bit more concrete how much, it, how much it might cost the patient and they will request payment here. Or traditionally, you will find them for the advanced payments after the patient has communicated, okay, I want to visit your hospital. I'm willing to come there for treatment. Um, or in many cases, you will find it at the end of the treatment after everything has been done and the patient uh, plans to return, the hospital uh, will ask him for at least paying whatever has been left out from the advance payment. Next slide, please. So what are these payment obstacles we see in medical tourism? Number one, often large sums in play. So we see uh, if it's for uh, larger surgeries or even some complicated diagnostic mechanisms and, to and tools, this can one up to the five, six digits and sometimes even more. Uh, and for many patients, these are not numbers they usually have, they usually care about uh, transferring to anybody. Uh, the same goes for the sponsors. It's uh, if you have a regular practice of diagnostic che checkups that you finance, and then you are faced with a, a bit larger number for a complicated medical procedure. This is out of the ordinary. There's other processes involved. You have a complicated process. Uh, transferring money usually is quite simple, at least if you do it in country and even internationally. If you are experienced, it is not really hard. Um, however, if you see the information that some patients need to have in order to be able to transfer the money. It goes beyond the invoice. They need the address, the exact address of the bank, which might sound standard to people who work in accounting and finance, but for the ordinary patient, this is a bit more complicated. And this draws out the process. You have very high fees, high sums, high fees. Uh, and these high fees might even deter patients from actually visiting a hospital since what they lose out. We have seen, uh, we have seen fees up to five to seven to 10%, even depending on where the patient is from. In some countries, it's really uh, immense. And then they decide to search for medical treatment in the country where they have better payment processes. You have in transparency. I will elaborate on this later. You have multiple possible rec recipients. It might be the hospital. Many hospitals have different accounts. They have different responsibilities. It might be directed um, to the department directly or to the international office. So this is an issue that comes in. Um, you have no instantaneous payment, of course. You want to travel immediately as a patient. You transfer the money, but you are not getting your visa invitation before the money has been cleared on the recipient's account. And of course, you have to deal with the fee deductions as a hospital. What do you do if you receive less money than you actually uh, invoice the patient for because your bank or his bank deducted a fee? How to process these without... Uh, hurting the patient and, and damaging the patient experience. So the consequences that we see in practice are patients uh, opting for payment intermediaries, which are often the facilitators, and you have them to, or well, you have them opt for cash payment upon arrival, which many patients, especially from the GCC and CIS, prefer in many cases. We can go to the next one. Thank you. So what's the issue with cash payments? Uh, let, 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 let's look at it. I mean, generally, many hospitals and many many enterprises, they don't like to accept cash payments, uh, which is understandable. There are certain regulations that might be involved. Uh, but if we look at the situation that the patient has uh, overpaid per the final calculation, so he has maybe transferred money or he has paid in cash before he, uh, uh, when he arrived, and then he has already left the country, but the final calculation in, in, in medicine, hospitals, it always uh, often happens. It can take up to two, three, four weeks until this is done especially if you have certain laboratories involved, certain departments outside of your clinic, this can take some time. Now, the issue is that you need to refund this money to the patient. He will request it at some point, of course. Um, the issue that we then see is, depending on the regulations in your country, the hospital isn't allowed to transfer money that has been overpaid in cash. So this is an uh, ALM issue and this is where many patients do not understand why the hospital isn't paying them back. And then the hospital, of course, they try to communicate, we are not allowed to, which often sounds to many patients um, as something quite convenient to the hospital, although it's fact. It's in general, always cash payments are, especially in huge sums, a compliance risk, um, especially from certain regions. And 
uh, this just poses an entirely unwanted outcome for the hospital and for the patient. So we can go to the next one. And this is where the solution often it tries to be provided. And these are patient intermediaries. So we have this scenario that we just seen. Uh, you have a patient in, uh, payment intermediary, and this might be then a medical tourism facilitator. Um, because of course, what they have other regulations than the hospitals, they can in many cases accept cash payments. And what they will do, they will guarantee payment for the patient. They will collect it from the patient um, and then forward the money to the hospital. Maybe the facilitator even has a foreign account to which the patient can transfer the money without any high fees. And uh, he can accept maybe the payment receipt as confirmation for the payment to speed up the process. The issue that we have then is the hospital doesn't really know what did the patient actually pay to this facilitator? What did he pay for the medical treatment? Many hospitals are, <clears throat> excuse me, satisfied once they will receive what they have invoiced the patient for, but hospitals also have, if not a legal, at least a moral obligation to take care that patients do not get taken advantage of by facilitators. And this is not to um, knock on facilitators. As I've said, I'm still to a certain degree um, taking the wall of a facilitator, uh, but it has to be said that the third party always poses uh, a risk and hospitals have a certain obligation to protect the patient from these kinds of risks. We have no system of tracking the progress on a refund. If the hospital pays the intermediary based on the uh, patient's instruction, they do not know what is happening. They cannot really close this file internally. And uh, of course, the hospital has to trust this intermediary and might often not be willing to work with him, but on, on, on the patient's instructions, it is the only option to take. So again, we have an unwanted outcome. We can go to the next one. So what can you do? Uh, small, small idea on the solutions. Uh, try to find direct payment pathways. Try to not have the intermediaries. They have their role. Intermediaries and facilitators can be very important, but try to take care of these payment processes directly between, the, uh, between you and the patient. Uh, implement technologies, payment solutions that make it uh, easier. And don't forget, Keith has said it, everybody's talking about marketing or how to, how to bring patients to your hospital. But at the end of the day, payment is an integral part. So make sure you design this process as uh, smoothly and patient friendly as possible, because you don't, you don't want any kind of bad experiences or, or cognitive dissonance the patient might have had because he isn't getting his refund. That's it from my side. I think we can skip to the end. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I yield back my time to Keith. Thanks, Christian, for that insight. Um, I've got some a, a few questions. Some of them aren't specific to the, the money flow. Um, but let me fire one at you. And it's about your role of, as a facilitator in the payment process. You know, to what extent it, within your business do you collect the money on behalf of the patients or are you very much kind of, we want the patient to pay direct to the hospital and your business at the moment, to what extent do you get involved in collecting the cash? It always has been the latter. So we want the patient to pay directly to the hospital, be it cash, be it via transfer. Um, this is just because we have always been doing it this way. And we want the patient to know what he is paying for medical services and what he might be paying for uh, other services. However, there's exceptions. There are certain companies, especially in the GCC, that we have been working with for over 20, 30 years. And they actually want us to pay the hospital because they just want to be presented a final bill, including all the um, yeah. tickets and this is then what we provide to them but this is trust that we have built over 30 years so they know exactly what's happening and we always attach the original invoice so it's a small role we play only for certain clients okay uh, and the question that always gets asked of facilitators is kind of what's your business model so so how do you make your money so where you know let's say the bill to the hospital is ten thousand pounds ten thousand dollars ten thousand euros that's what the patient pays the hospital how are you making your income from the transaction? Uh, we don't uh, at all. So we do charge the patient a fee for our services, uh, for every service that we render. It might, it might be the facilitation itself. We usually yeah. provide three different options. We do not take any commissions from hospitals since we have okay. found for ourselves it's important. We used to in the past. So first of all, there's legal changes in German law, so yeah. you are prohibited from taking them. But also we want to be completely unbiased and only represent the patient's interest. Yeah, that, that's my other question was about, well, you know, are you influenced? How do you make the choice of hospital for the patient as a facilitator? 
yeah, it is. It is. We really every case gets cho gets chosen basically as in your case. We have no hospital portfolio. We have some hospitals the patient requests themselves. But what we do is we look at the case and we see who the best practitioner is for this individual case. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Obviously, the concern in some parts of the world is the role of facilitator in terms of influencing hospital choice based on the commission, the kickback. You know, if that's legal in that part of the world, and and how that might affect things. Okay. Um. Sorry. Carry on. Yeah, I would just say, uh, and it's a very valid concern I have to add, and it's actually my specialization on the legal part, I specialize exactly on this. I wrote it, I've wrote, written my thesis on this topic because it's just, it's an integral part of medical tourism. And there's, in my opinion, better ways to do it. Um, and I understand every patient who has this concern of the facilitator might be, might be biased. Yeah. Um, you obviously do a lot of business with the, the Gulf states. Um, I think people would be interested in your view on the outbound medical travel market from the Gulf, whether it be that self-pay or government sponsored and what changes uh, you're seeing in that travel market. Are they choosing different destinations? Are they looking for lower costs? What's your view on that? Generally, they are. I, I won't say they're looking for lower costs, but what they are, they are far more aware of what they're actually pay, uh, paying. Um, they use tools of comparison. They are one of the best informed patients. They used to be the least informed patient, but right. the GCC patients are one of the best informed patients or amongst them. Um, they really look at who they are visiting. Regarding other markets, they might be visiting the newer generations. Yes, they basically do a new search, but there's the older generation who still has this tradition of coming to a certain destination. It might be the UK, the US, Germany, and this is what they continue to choose. Yeah. Okay. Um, question about COVID-19. Obviously, um, it's had a massive impact on medical travel businesses. There are many facilitators around the globe who are no longer in business. You've obviously survived and, uh, and will continue to thrive. How, how has it affected your business? How have you got through this very difficult period? So it didn't hit us at all because the facilitation practice we have is very, very minor to be quite frank, it's not what we monetize on. So our focus okay. is the consulting services we provide to hospitals, which of course also have gone back to a certain extent during that time. But um, since it's a family run business, we are in control of what we do and when we do it, it is a quite comfortable position to be in. But if I see what's happened to our competition or other companies or even the hospitals who have had like a drop of 90% in international patients, yeah. most even more, um, it's a difficult time for, for most of these hospitals, I would say. I yeah. Uh, on your uh, consultancy service, I, I penned a blog for International Medical Travel Journal yesterday about, you know, despite what's happened in medical travel and, uh, and COVID-19, there are still a whole bunch of wannabe medical travel destinations appearing on the scene all over the world that, that see that as being a money generator for their economy. But what kind of key advice would you give to a wannabe destination before they start spending a chunk of money on becoming the next medical tourism destination uh, don't do it uh, <laughs> it, it is it is i'm in this business so i consult many destinations but I've, yep. I've i've written at one time that every destination that has i think one hospital and one english-speaking doctor they they consider themselves to be a medical tourism destination okay. and this is a huge mistake Certainly, if you find USPs, if you find UVPs, and if you find yourself in the position to offer something extra, something that patients might need, be it in your immediate border regions or further away, then build on this and try to always emphasize the patient experience and the safety. But if you are not sure you can do it, and it's just a, um, I won't say money grab, but a fast way to, to solve some economic issues, don't do it because it's an immense effort you have. And anything that goes wrong, it might hurt your destination in the future even in the non-medical related markets. Thank you, Christian. That's been excellent. Uh, stick around, uh, join us uh, for the panel afterwards. Um, to the audience, if Thank you've you got much. any questions for Christian specifically on what he's talked about, um, please stick them in the Q&A uh, and stick around for his contribution uh, in the panel at the end. So our next contributor uh, from another part of Europe, uh, Anthony arias Henry who's Director of Private and International Care at the uh, Barcelona Children's Hospital. So welcome, Anthony. Um, he's going to give us 
the sharp end view, the view of the, the provider who has to deal with these patients or payers who, who, who don't come up with the cash. Uh, so over to you, Anthony. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. And thanks, Keith, uh, to, to invite us to participate and, and for the, this opportunity. So uh, please, next one. Uh, the, the, what I will uh, be addressing are three main topics uh, who we are just to explain wh what we are doing, our international program and some figures and the challenges we have related to the payment uh, issues that is the, the topic uh, of this uh, session. Next, please. Next. So uh, our hospital is a children's and maternity center, uh, understanding children until 18 years of age, a university hospital linked to the University of Barcelona, and uh, we are a not-for-profit institution. We belong to a religious order that is worldwide extended. And, but, and we have, however, a long-term agreement with the public health system in Spain. So we offer service to a uh, population of our uh, city and of our region. And of course, as a reference center for all our country. Next point. So uh, we have a long uh, history. We were founded in, uh, in 1867 more than 150 years ago as a charity hospital. And we have been evolving uh, towards a highly specialized center in the last uh, 20, 30 years. Next, please. And our strategy is nowadays a higher specialization even in rare diseases, including, uh, including children's cancer. This is our center of uh, new center of pediatric cancer. Uh, that will be opening in May next year. Next, please. Uh, as the main figures, we uh, have uh, 320 beds, more than 2,000 uh, staff members, uh, including all the our uh, colleagues at the hospital. And we uh, attend more than 25,000 admissions, 20 of them pediatrics and uh, 5,000 uh, maternity admissions. Uh, more than, uh, than 240,000 outpatient visits, etc. Next, please. As uh, our position, just to, to show you that we are in the five biggest uh, pediatric centers in Europe. Uh, with our colleagues in, in, other, in other countries that we belong to the same organization, the Children's Hospital uh, European Organization. Next, please. And let's go to the second uh, point. Uh, some, some, uh, some words about our uh, international program. We are relatively young in this uh, business if we are talking about proactive uh, program of international uh, offer of services, of medical services to foreign patients. We started in 2013, and I would say that our leading specialties are oncology and hematology, pediatric oncology and hematology, neurosciences, neurology and neurosurgery, heart diseases, orthopedic surgery and traumatology, especially uh, focus on, the, on, on, on malformations, fetal medicine and fetal surgery, and all the bunch of what uh, we have been talking about, rare diseases. We offer all the other specialties, and all the specialties have some procedure, very specialized, but this is our leading specialist and in abroad. The next, please. If we talk about the demand uh, of treatment, we receive most of the, uh, a third uh, approximately of our request of treatment from the, the, the CI uh, countries, Russia and USSR, uh, about 22% of, uh, from Latin America. Europe is another part of our uh, attraction of, of demand, Middle East, or GCC countries, let us say, uh, North of Africa and uh, Asia and, and Pacific uh, countries. Next, please. 
By specialty, by far, oncology, neurology, and hematology account for most, uh, most part of the requests that we have. Uh, followed by traumatology and, and orthopedics, ophthalmology, pediatrics, surgery, cardiology, and women's health. Next, please. If we are talking about real patients that arrive to the hospital, and in, in, in this different, of course, the conversion rate, many issues about payment are uh, causing these uh, this, um, let me say, difference in, in one and another, in demand and really patients arrive. Uh, however, uh, 20, more than 20% of the patients in 2019, that is the last normal year before the pandemic, 20% uh, were coming from uh, CI uh, countries, 20% uh, 20, 20 came from Latin America, 17% for were coming from the GCC, 16-17% uh, coming from Europe, and 8.5% coming from Asia and uh, Pacific uh, countries. Next, please. If we are talking about who pays the treatment, which are be, be behind the, the payment of, of these uh, treatments, let me say that nowadays, 55% uh, is out of pocket, are paid by the families or patients directly. Uh, and 45% that are involved third party players, uh, payers. So the third party payers have been growing in the last few years, as you can observe here in this figure. So this is uh, a description of our uh, situation in, in terms of the international program. Next, please. Now we go to the third uh, topic that I would like to address. The first area of, the, of challenges that we are facing uh, are related to the kind of patient. We, have, we are attending children mainly. So ch children are very sensible issue in our society. So, uh, and especially uh, children with severe disease and complex treatments. Take into account that 55% of our patients nowadays are from, uh, from the specialty of oncology, treated for, for, for a cancer uh, disease. And once the patient is a child, is at the hospital, the treatment uh, must be finished. So we cannot say, oh, if you are lack of money, take the patient away. This, uh, I believe that you, are, you understand the situation and is uh, usual, at least in our countries in Europe. And the, let me say that related to this, the payment problems are depending on the cost of the treatment for these specific patients. Of course, higher, uh, higher costs are most difficult to get all the, uh, all the payment done especially when there is a risk of complications or extended treatments when they are in the hospital and have paid the first amount uh, or related to the quotation. The second, please, the second area, next. The second area of challenges are related to the, the, uh, the, re, the, the requirements and the process of payment. Uh, first of all, the existing regulations, the, for instance, the anti-money laundering directive of the European Union, it makes uh, sometimes difficult to uh, get the, all the accreditation and validation of who is paying the money, except when is the family or the, the patient that pays, that is quite easy to, uh, to uh, comply with the, uh, these uh, regulations. Another, uh, another uh, challenge is the, the money change of the country of origin, of course. For instance, where the, the, the coin of in Russia goes down, so there is more problems for the payment, so less patients are able to come. The third issue are the payment systems of the country uh, of origin some count and the culture behind it. Some, uh, some countries, they use and they like to pay in cash. So here we, we cannot accept payments in cash, in, at least in our country, and 
due to our the bank regulation that we have more than 3000 uh, uh, euros so they have to pay by transfer so this is a problem to to to, uh, to make understanding the, the the people sometimes to get the payment done especially with uh, from from several countries and we have experienced that there are many platforms and ways of payment depending on the origin of the patient that makes us uh, for us a challenge to adapt ourselves to these different systems of payment. For instance, from uh, China, they pay, uh, they used to pay through WeChat. So uh, this is difficult <laughs> to, to articulate in, 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 with the regulations that we have. And finally, the banking systems that, uh, that also may be a problem. 99% uh, of the payments in, in our hospital are done by transfers. So sometimes a transfer is coming from uh, a, a country, uh, from a bank that have intermediaries in the, by, in the middle. And when we have to make a tracking of all the, uh, the, the payment, uh, sometimes it's difficult to get to the point to identify exactly what has happened with this payment, just as an example. And next one, final. The third area of challenges uh, are related to the kind of payer. When the payer is the patient or the family directly, uh, we, we request a payment in advance, but sometimes uh, the money is not enough, especially for oncology and, and similar patients due to the severity of the disease and the risk of complications and the risk of extension of treatments, as I told before. So the risk of potential debt is uh, there. We have been dealing with it, I would say, reasonably at the, this stage, but is always there this risk. When uh, there are funds and charities behind, usually is the best way to assure the payment of the money if they comply with all the regulations that I mentioned before. And third, when there are governments behind, uh, we have to adapt ourselves to their procedures, very strict procedures. We have to be very aware of having all the warranty uh, letter pay, uh, of the, for the payments in uh, really correct and, and really uh, with the treatment that it will be done in the hospital. Sometimes there are problems with the deviations of the treatment, as I mentioned before, and it is difficult to justify. And finally, there are uh, the risk also of late payments, as was mentioned by Christian uh, before. Uh, late payments, but uh, if you assure the procedures, warranties, and good relationship, in our experiences, uh, maybe it takes a little bit longer than expected, but it's always paid by the, by the government. Next and final, this is, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is one of the discussions that we have in the hospital. So this is uh, our, my, my contribution to this session up to now. Thank you, Anthony. Um, Thanks. Some questions for you. What, out of interest, what's the kind of typical size of the bill, typical patient? What, what kind of range does it sit within <laughs> without disclosing too much? Let roughly. me say that the usual, uh, talking about oncology patients, yep. they may rise from uh, 150,000 to 300 euros, depending yeah, sure. on the complications so, and yeah, yeah, yeah. what is going on. No, I understand that. Um, that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, so how, how, in practical terms, how do you deal with it? Let's say a patient's, a child's coming for oncology treatment, you've estimated it at, let's say, 200,000 euros. And then, as you say, you can't release the treatment, doesn't quite work as expected. You can't send the patient back home. It's going to cost another 50,000 or 100,000 euros who has that conversation with the patient's family or the payors to say, look, we need another 50,000, we need another 100,000? Yeah. No, we usually uh, we talk with the family. The, 
the, the, the responsible of our international patients department, the operational side of our uh, division, and uh, some, uh, some, uh, all, uh, some, let me say, staff from the uh, financial department. Uh, so we what, try to agree with them uh, payment plan. And what happens if they say, we haven't got the cash, we just, we cannot afford this? What, what do you do then? Do you write it off or do you, uh, where do you go? Well, I have to say that sometimes we have to write it off. Yeah, but yeah. it is not very frequent. They get to pay. Okay. And sometimes we help either to find some payer uh, that can help them to, to pay the, the difference that is, that is there. Yeah, and I was interested in what you were saying about different countries, different cultures want to pay in different ways. Yeah. Um, at Lang Buisson, we did some research uh, recently um, on patients traveling from various countries to other countries. And uh, the one that did surprise me, I have to say, was Chinese patients who travel abroad. And we asked them a lot of detail about how they paid. And, I, and it did surprise us. So, you know. We pay by WeChat. <laughs> yeah, um, when, when they, they they can pay WeChat with through WeChat when it's a, a small amount. Yeah. In our case, but when there is a big amount that, uh, like I told you, uh, they should do a transfer. And so you know, different different source markets have very different preferences in terms of how they want to pay you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, within your hospital, in terms of collecting the month, collecting the debt, let's say the bad debt, um, do you handle that in house, or do you go outside to deck an external kind of debt collection service? Usually, we had in house. Uh, I remember a situation with the government that we had to rely on a third party. Okay, um, and and your map of where your patients come from was very interesting very different mix to yeah. what i think people might have expected actually you know a lot from uh, south america a lot from uh, obviously the gulf and obviously from russia and the cis um without damning too many countries um which of those markets present the biggest challenge in terms of collecting the money when you get a patient from country a and think oh, if you if, if we if we mean where it is more difficult to raise yeah. the money to pay, yeah, or, to, or, for you to, or for you to get the payment, which one's uh, Latin most? America? Latin America. I would say that is the region most difficult to, to at least for the patients that uh, we receive requests for treatment. Yeah, um, and, and a last final question for you. Um, obviously, exchange rates play a can play a big part. You know, if you've got a a patient booking and then effectively the treatment period might extend over from booking to treatment over three months or possibly longer how do you how do you deal with the issue of a, a significant change in exchange rates they pay at your mm. price so they pay yeah, yeah they, they they have to pay in euros that's the, the difficulty so simple as that yeah i i understand that uh that it may deter some patients and families to come to the hospital for treatment when there is a problem like this. But uh, there is a balance, and we have a we we try to to keep a balance between uh, having patients and uh, the risk of uh, failure in collecting the money. Okay, you know, and this is a difficult balance. Is 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 always there so we we have to deal with it and we try to do our best but i can only say this yeah okay okay thanks anthony excellent thanks. uh join us later on for the panel sure. um before we move to andrew our final speaker uh i just want to run a couple of polls jade could you now what i'd like the audience to do is just take a look at the the poll question here uh, which should come up on your screen shortly i trust So here comes the poll. So um, what I'd like you to do is just indicate from the point of view of your business, which of these pain points does your institution face or has faced? Um, you can select one, 
or you can select as many as you like or four if that's uh, those are issues for you so i'll just give you a couple of minutes to uh vote on that and hopefully you'll interact with this jade will let me know whether people are voting and when we've got uh a few votes in jade if you could show the uh outcome all right jade just let me know that you're still voting I'll just give it a minute. So here we go. Let's see if we agree with our speakers so far. So the biggest issue, according to our audience, is about communication between the provider and the patient. OK, let's log that one. If we can close that, Jade, and just put up the, the second poll. And this is about pain points from the patient's view. So we're asking you, what do you think the pain points are that your patients face? And again, it's multiple choice. You can choose one or you can choose all of these. So we'll give you a minute to vote on those. Okay, we're still voting. And just a reminder that if you have got some questions, we've had a few come in for our panelists, um, please put them in the Q&A and we'll fire them at the panelists at the end of the session. Excellent, ah, right, okay. Local currency and flexible payments. I'll just mark that up to follow that up with our panel. Okay, and payment not arriving on time. That's obviously an issue if you've got a patient needing kind of urgent treatment. Excellent. If you could close that, Jade. And we'll move to our next speaker, uh, Andrew Brown from our partner for this webinar um, from Western Union. Um, Andrew, we've heard from uh, uh, two people actively involved in, in kind of dealing with this problem. Um, Let's hope you've got a solution. Mm -hmm. I hope so too. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Keith. And many thanks to Christian and Anthony for their insights. And to all of you who chose to spend your valuable time with us. So hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I hope you're all keeping well wherever you are joining us today. These are challenging and hopeful times. So learning and collaborating are key to our collective success. Western Union Business Solutions is a globally trusted cross-border, cross-currency money service provider for key service industries like medical tourism. We are proud to support today's discussion about the current challenges of accepting international patient payments and sharing some ways to improve your collection rate, cash flow, and overall patient satisfaction. Next slide, please. We will be exploring the current problems of accepting these payments and helping present easy to implement solutions that bring peace of mind to patients and financially financial stability to providers. Next slide, please. For over 25 years, I've been fortunate to work for a variety of health and human service organizations in patient finance and business operations and know firsthand the difficulties medical providers have getting paid for getting paid in full and on time for care or to clear outstanding balances. At New York Presbyterian Hospital, a top US medical center, I served as the head of global financial operations where I managed international patient access, billing, collections, and payables across the enterprise. <clears throat> there I saw the need and explored the market for assistance, as you might be as well. And through our strategic partnership with Western Union Business Solutions, we were able to vastly simplify the payment process for our patients and staff. I am fortunate now as senior manager for Western Union Business Solutions to apply my client perspective and experiences 
to help connect international patients to medical care by simplifying the complexities of cross-border, cross-currency payments. Next slide, please. For medical providers, the challenges are numerous and add a great deal of cost and dissatisfaction and ultimately diminish the overall patient experience and their willingness to refer others for care. Traditionally, international patient payments are handled by many banks throughout the process. So identifying and reconciling payments takes extraordinary time and effort to match payments to patients. This lead leads to delays in financially clearing the patient for care and settling their final balances in an organized fashion. As a result, too much time and effort are spent researching and responding to worried patients about surprise bills, lack of customer service support, what are the most effective payment methods, and where their payments are located while it is sent across multiple banks and borders. Lastly, the medical provider has no real tools to ensure incoming and outgoing patient funds are screened against illegal activities. Next slide, please. International patients who are contemplating travel for treatment or have an existing balance are often confronted with difficulties knowing how much they owe and how best to pay for their charges without high transaction fees or limitations on the amount that could be sent out of the country. Patients are very anxious about the whereabouts of their payment, especially when there is a clinical urgency to be approved for treatment or to close their account to avoid referral to a collection agency. Patients mistrust how their funds are being handled and always suspect financial fraud and abuse. Patients complain about the lack of options to pay in their local currency. And after their medical care has been completed and their account reconciled, Patients are often unhappy about how much time and effort goes into receiving a refund or making their final payment. Next slide, please. Our answer to these problems is global pay for patients. The medical provider directs patients to pay their deposits or balances on their co-branded online payment portal hosted by Western Union Business Solutions. Patients receive a competitive foreign exchange quote to pay the billed amount in their chosen local currency. They are presented options to pay by bank wire transfer or other available methods, and their submitted funds are deposited by Western Union Business Solutions directly into your bank account with full tracking and payment guaranteed, and with complete details to credit their patient account. Next slide, please. Western Union Business Solutions helps address these provider and patient difficulties through its extensive network of local bank accounts around the world. Processing fees for the patient and for the provider are either greatly reduced or eliminated through this process. Payments from other third-party guarantors, such as international insurance companies and government sponsors, can also enjoy local currency payment options to your medical center to enjoy similar benefits. Next slide, please. And it is useful to see how Western Union Business Solutions supports the entire medical community, regardless of speciality, and inbound or outbound payment use case. Next slide, please. Ensuring the positive patient financial experience is so important nowadays as your organization builds back volume and works to close outstanding open balances. Each interaction must create an exceptional experience, not only clinically, but financially to ensure future success. For the patient, I have found it essential they have easy ways to understand how much is owed and have many ways to pay in their local currency to avoid international fees and capital flight restrictions. Next slide, please. Patients appreciate working with providers who offer the lowest possible transaction fees and best exchange rates and the least restrictions that they can send per transaction. And of course, having their refunds processed back to the original source or their designated bank account can be a real customer service differentiator for your facility. These distinct developments all, that, all add up to a less anxious and more grateful patient who is more likely to return and refer others as travel for treatment continues to resume. Next slide, please. 
medical providers, after a routine know your customer onboarding process, can easily introduce their new international payment portal. Our turnkey approach allows providers to simply share on their invoices the hyperlink to their dedicated online payment portal, which involves no special resources to implement. Over time, providers with larger transaction volumes may elect to undertake a fuller integration with their electronic health record or financial package with the global pay platform, where key payment details are automatically passed to facilitate the data entry and posting processes. Next slide, please. As part of the standard set of Western Union business solution services, implementation includes customized promotional support on how best to promote their new payment portal as part of their billing and online presence. And most of all, clients enjoy dedicated account management services and invitations to specialized educational webinars around best practices, especially fraud prevention. Compliance is a key aspect of all these efforts to ensure that all local, regional, and global regulations are understood and adhered to with every payment. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank you again for your time and interest, and please feel free to reach out to me or my regional co colleagues directly through our contact information below. Now I'll hand it back to Keith to help moderate any questions or thoughts that this generates amongst our attendees or panelists. Thank you, Andrew. Um, now, we did a poll earlier on asking what did they, what did our audience think the biggest challenge was for providers? Um, in your experience, what really stands out for you? Uh, and what do you think is the biggest problem that your solution solves for a, for a hospital or a clinic dealing with international patients? Sure, yeah, and no, I mean, that there's so many uh, concerns. I think if I were to kind of repeat myself, I think uh, making sure that the provider gets paid in full so that there's no loss of payment along the banking network so that there's no embarrassment of having to go back to a patient for fees that were deducted or to have to write that off. I think uh, knowing that through an ecosystem like ours, uh, the payment would be timely, which can be very sensitive for yep. cl clinical care. Uh, and that goes part and parcel with the tracking that we can offer. But I think most of all, is the compliance feature, uh, which I know um, Anthony spoke of. And I think right now when providers are giving out their uh, own business payment details, they're essentially counting on their bank to run all of the uh, quality checks. And as we know, there are numerous, especially in Europe, insofar as identifying bad actors. And so I think working with uh, a partner who's dedicated to ensuring that their um, all payments are interrogated is and handing that responsibility to a trusted partner, I think is is something that should not be understated. Okay, um, and Western Union obviously handles uh, a, a large uh, chunk of money transfer, cash transfer within this medical travel sector. Um, you know, people are always asking me, well, you know, where are the biggest flows? Where's the biggest money transactions happening? What's your kind of view from the business you have at the moment? You know, what's, what's the largest kind of areas of opportunity in terms of money flow? What are the significant flows from where to where? Who's spending sure. the most on, which country is spending the most on international patient care? There you go. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think, um, you know, this obviously pre-COVID, um, I think one of the major areas that uh, having, you know, myself being centered in the U.S. is, uh, you know, seeing from the MENA area as well as uh, LATAM, um, and I think a good amount from Eastern Europe. Right. Uh, and so I think what will be interesting in this new world order is how you know, where does the demand reemerge? You know, do we fall back into those uh, patterns? Uh, do new patterns fall? And I think that's why it's important to have that a great breadth of currency um, acceptance capability because we really don't know how the deck chairs will 
rearrange. Right. Uh, and so um, being being able to handle exotic, and I say that kindly, exotic currencies is, is very important uh, because you don't want to go through a whole process of um, uh, intaking a, a patient only to realize that you can't accept their funds. And I think that's where we're proud to step in and, and be a help. Okay. Uh, and, and from your view on, on the kind of medical travel market in general, um, you know, people are always looking for the next kind of big win. I mean, historically, in terms of kind of complex treatment, you know, the, the market that everyone targets is, is the Gulf. Um, we're always getting asked about, you know, is China the next big thing? Should we be targeting Russia and the CIS? If you were running an international hospital, where would you be focusing your efforts to, to grow your business, your international patient business? Well, I think having come from and being in the U.S. and having worked at New York Presbyterian, certainly, you know, we, we were proud to be a center or at least a professed center of excellence for, for various specialties. And I think um, many travelers are highly sensitive to the U.S. News and World Report rankings. Um, so I think that there is a special challenge, but also opportunity for non-U.S. providers to um, go out to market and uh, really uh, show the population, the constituencies, that they have uh, just as good uh, centers of excellence. Not, not all the good care is in the U.S., and that they should um, really look to um, whether they've been accredited through many accreditation partners that are out there, whether they have gained um, certain accolades, um, and really lean into that because I found in New York that uh, patients really were seeking um, high profile doctors and high profile um, centers with uh, low morbidity rates and high success rates. So to the extent that um, providers can um, put that together as part of their business plans mm -hmm. and really be a viable and probably cheaper. Um, I'm, I'm sort of saying something like, you know that subverts the U.S. market, but I think something if you could be cheaper as well, um, it's a it's a shorter trip for patients, and it's a just as good quality at a better price. And so I think the way you position yourself is very important. I think um, speaking to the specialties that you, um, I think in oncology, there's a lot of pent up demand in cardiac care. And obviously, you know, the, the less clinically urgent but personally driven services of cosmetic care um, and the equally important fertility market is yeah. very important. So I think, um, you know, creating um, centers of saying, you know, you don't have to travel as far, you don't have to spend as much. And by the way, um, and I and I'm speaking somewhat, you know, um, for my own purpose, but I think that you have not just a great clinical program, a concierge program, but also a great financial experience. All of those things will, I think, help divert uh, patients away from the U.S. and to your center. Okay. <clears throat> One last very quick question that's come from the audience um, from Eliana Valderrama. Is this service available in South America? That is an excellent question. And I wow. think it depends, uh, <laughs> as, as we know, and I'll try to be as neutral as possible, certain countries uh, do not have as stable um, currency situations okay. as, we, as we would like. Um, but I definitely would enjoy um, speaking with that person um, and we could try to connect them with the right colleagues. Um, I do have colleagues uh, that, that handle the, the uh, uh, other part of the hemisphere. So definitely I'd be interested to talk more about that, uh, the options there. Okay, thanks. Okay, Jade, if we can bring, thank you for your contribution, Andrew, let's bring the panelists back together. Um, and we're going to finish with about 15 minutes of uh, some questions that we've had in advance from people. Uh, a couple of questions that have come in from the audience and some that I'd like to, uh, to fire. Um, let me just take uh, the 
first one. Yeah, this is a question about the recovery of medical travel post COVID. Um, and and post COVID is a difficult word uh, phrase because we are not in a post COVID world because as we know, uh, it is still here. And um, question from Jackie Avadia, who's saying, and I'll fire this at all three of you, um, what's the kind of scope of interest level of medical travel in 2021 compared to pre-COVID 2019? You know, is business, how, to what extent is it back to, to normal business? Um, and when do you think it's going to get back to normal, if that's not the case? So, Christian, I'm going to start with you. Uh, thank you. So I, I, I really do not like to make any kind of uh, prediction on this topic or in general, because I mean, there, there's no parameter to, to guess by. But what to say, uh, as you said, we are still not in a post-COVID world. We will not know when post-COVID will be the situation. And uh, the way it goes now, it might be anticipated. This will take a couple of years, maybe, yeah. especially in terms of general economic recovery. Now, what we do see However, is in, I mean, this, this us gathering here is, is a sign of this. And I've been on many conferences on site, online in the past two years, actually. The medical tourism stakeholders are quite persistent and quite energetic compared to other industries. I, I am also involved in other industries except medical tourism. And I see them being very energetic in, in promoting medical tourism around the globe. You have many new players who have developed uh, within the pandemic years. And also many patients have been for the first time faced with a situation that they might not get adequate medical treatment on time in their home country. So medical tourism is to the first time for them actually something they think about because they were looking for a solution and this is what has presented. So I think we are looking at a positive recovery. I'm not going to, to, to um, mirror the sentiment that many people have. It's going to be a very, very steep way up and it's going to be great and better than ever because this really depends on the destination you are in. But I would say we will see definitely arise as soon as possible. And it, it's going to be fluct, uh, fluctuation. So anytime somebody isn't able to get medical treatment in his home country, the destinations that are viable for him might see a rise in medical travelers and others might not, also depending on the restrictions, lockdowns, whatever it might be. Yeah. Anthony, is your business back to 2019 levels? I mean, you have 40% of your business was historically international. Yeah. What's it looking like today? No, the um, nowadays we are we are seeing a huge recovery in demand. So and in the real patients that are arriving to to the to the hospital, what we see during the COVID period is that the a decrease, of course, of demand and patients that uh, arrive due to all the limitations, and uh, but it was a shift. There was a shift from. The, the, the really the decrease was in the low uh, middle complexity patients, but higher we growth in the segment of high complexity patients. I assume because there was difficult to find a place to be treated. For instance, pediatric oncology is the example that they put. We in 2020 even we had more patients that in 2018. Okay. Uh, of oncology and now we uh, experience an increase again and progressive increase again uh, of demand and patients uh, are arriving so we expect in 2022 to get a uh, usual the usual number or Back even more levels. than we had yeah okay um just change the question for you andrew um i just want to move on to another question which is uh yeah, what we see in the certainly what's happening in the UK in the kind of self pay self funded market is a move to kind of credit and finance schemes to fund healthcare treatment. Um, is that something that you're seeing within Western Union globally? Um, or is that a long way off? Is it, you know, really just about finding the cash to pay for the treatment? Or are there finance providers coming into the market? Well, I know in the US there are certain um, sort of like medical credit card companies. I don't okay. know I don't know if they're the same in Europe. Um, I know that there is um, a number of uh, banking solutions. I believe one of them is Klarna, and I think some others that are emerging on the scene. And I think what is interesting about them, the way I understand them is they're sort of like a buy now, pay later 
uh, situation. And I think to the extent that we, we enable a number of those, uh, we call them alternate payment methods in our uh, payment portal. So that if in a way, um, you know, a client can quote unquote finance their, um, their payment um, or could make, could use multiple payment methods to, um, to complete the purchase, you know, the, the full amount that's needed. Yeah, Christian, have you seen any evidence of that? Uh, not directly. What we have seen more than before is crowdfunding medical treatment. Uh, okay. This is something that we have, especially for medical tourism, this is something that, that came to my radar actually the first time really in the presence uh, in, in 2020. Um, but for private organizations, credit card companies or credit companies focusing on healthcare, we have not seen this in Germany, at least not to a huge extent. Um, it might be something that, that's coming into the future as new markets have been uh, entered and these are not the traditional markets that are let's say financially uh, yep. stable or, or um, better off so it, it might definitely be something that we see we see it in general in the, in the economy we see much more companies as Klarna offering their services to advance the payment for for the client and this might very well enter into medical tourism uh, and kind of related to that um, the role of kind of package pricing not so much in the kind of the very complex areas that perhaps um, Anthony is dealing with in pediatrics, but, you know, the classic kind of orthopedics. Um, again, it's quite commonplace in the UK to have, you know, here's a hip replacement. It's going to cost you £10,000, £12,000, and that's an all-in package. Uh, is that happening more in international business? Is that common in German hospitals that you work with, for example? Or is it, it is, much more item of service? Yeah, internationally, it is more common, I would say, especially in certain destinations. If you're looking at India or Turkey uh, or Southeast Asia, there are some, some destinations that provide this. In Germany, it's not common. It's not allowed in most cases, even in, in the simpler procedures, which I'm going to have to be quite frank. I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not a fan of package prices in medical tourism because, number one, you suggest that this is going to be it. And even in the simplest procedures, there might be certain types of um, uh, complications which then the patient might feel might feel disinformed and also in, med, in at least in germany every procedure even if it's a diagnostic procedure it has to be tailored towards the patient um and so it is not even possible to give these package prices uh, but uh, internationally it's definitely something that's coming coming in it's, it's supposed to make the process easier for the patient okay uh, and anthony when you're uh, presumably when you have a patient coming to you you're you know, bringing your team together and, and giving them a kind of a quote, an estimate saying, this is what we think it will will cost. Is that the case? Uh, usually, let me say, in 80%, 85% of the cases. However, we are trying to work more and more in packages in order to, to get... Uh, <laughs> Let me say, use this word, an insurance to the to the yep. to the family about the money they will spend. However, they have to be as the usual uh, the, the, the the usual uh, let me say surgery procedures that are standardized and and the risk of deviation is quite small. Uh, this we are working. In. However, it is very difficult. As, as you say, if, especially if you are wor uh, working and dealing with uh, complex procedures. Uh, and would you take 100% of the cash up front or do you kind of stage the payment? What would be your fairly standard practice? No, we, our standard practice is uh, when he's a private patient, he's a yeah. patient of family, unfortunately, we have to request all the money up front. Okay, okay. When there is an agreement with a fund, a charity, or a government behind, we accept uh, warranty letters or uh, less payments in advance, depending on the case of each. But this is our, our policy in order not to, as I told you before, not to put in, in a risk, a necessary risk, the hospital. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're approaching uh, the end. Um, I'm just going to ask one quick question to each of you um, and a brief response. What's the one thing you would change to make it easier 
to facilitate international patient payments from the hospital's point of view? What one thing would you change tomorrow if you could, just to make it easier? <laughs> Christian. We'll go Christian, Anthony, Andrew, you get the final word. <laughs> I would choose one thing that also has many other positive effects. It's yep. just better, better communication on behalf of the hospital. Excellent. So you agree with our audience that the, uh, and I think this is true generally, you know, from the patients will say, well, what we want is to, we want to know what's going on with our, uh, our family, our, our patient, our money and so on. Um, Anthony, same view or different? Well, this is an important point, as Christian has made, but I would say the most crucial issue is to find ways to helping the, the private patients uh, in the payments. You see, okay. like the schemes that Andrew mentioned in the US or something like that, that could help them to have a more, uh, a more, more sense of, of security for, for their families uh, for the payments of the treatments. Okay. Uh, and Andrew, the last word from Western Union. Sure. Well, thank you all. Um, yeah, I think I would just echo all of that. And just, I think if anyone is looking for a solution, uh, definitely do, you know, look to market and see what's out there because there, there are options. Um, and of course, naturally, we're, we're here, even as a consultative, to help you connect you with those right resources um, because I think that there are options out there and I, I wish you all really well and thank you again. Okay, um, so thank you to our panelists. That's been an excellent session. I've really learned a great deal uh, from our contributors today. Um, to our audience, thanks for sparing the time to join us this afternoon. I hope you found it of value. This, there will be a recording of this uh, webinar made available. Uh, and the slides from the presentation will also be made available. So keep on an eye on your email um, tomorrow where we'll be sending you a follow-up. So thank you for from everyone from Languisson. Um, please use the hashtags medical tourism and at Languisson if you want to provide any feedback on today's event. Thank you very much, panelists. Enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon or evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. you very much. Thank you. Bye.